All right, I think I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, I'm Larry Butler for the East Hawaii Cultural Center. Thank you so much for joining. Um, this is a topic I hope will be of good current interest. There's lots going on in the museum world and in the broader world in the realm of cultural property and in the international law around it. So let me start my screen here. There we go. And everybody can you see the screen okay? I hope, yeah, okay, good. So who owns the past? Cultural heritage and international law. Yeah, really. Well, this is a topic that really begins back in the great age of museum building in the 18th to 19th centuries with the Louvre as the great museum of Europe. Um, Napoleon didn't found it, it was founded before then, but he certainly used it as a depot as he conquered so much of Europe and vacuumed up its treasures from the Vatican, from Florence, from Germany, from wherever, stuck them all in the Louvre, which was going to be the great encyclopedic museum of humankind. Um, that was the great idea at the moment, and it worked pretty well till his downfall in 1815, when most of the stuff, not all of it, most of the stuff was sent back to whatever Italian museum or German museum it came from. Nowadays, there's been an explosion of interest looking back at the ethics of all of this, not just museums, but also individual collecting and the treatment of cultural property in time of war. And of course, just basically defining cultural property. Um, some of these have actually been bestsellers. Loot is a, is a huge favorite I know with people. Um, she kind of takes the argument that, oh yeah, everybody should get their treasures back if they really feel like it. Um, I'll see if I can refine that a little bit more. What I want to do today is look at three specific topics in international law, the protection of cultural property, collecting and the art market, and museums and the restitution of cultural property. What I'm not gonna be doing is American law and American situations, including Hawaiian, because those are enormous topics of their own. So today I'll be concentrating on international law. Discussion of this really begins with World War I and this horrible series of pictures of the near destruction of Reims Cathedral in Northern France by the German Imperial Army. These became symbols, if you will, of the danger Europe faced from wartime targeting of cultural property. And yes, it was deliberately targeted, deliberately bombed. And it's still standing, as you can see in the photo on the left there, which gives us all hope for Notre Dame in Paris. These buildings are very, very strong. As the world started looking towards another world war in the 1930s, museums on both sides of the Atlantic began to organize and prepare for war. And look at that. Did you know that you could roll up Rembrandt's Night Watch? It actually got stored under a sand dune for the duration of World War II. There on the right, the Nike of Samothrace being taken out of the Louvre, down the grand staircase, and off to wherever she spent the war time. We know that the Luftwaffe Blitz of London and other places in England was meant to demoralize uh, the citizen population as well as to strike at industrial installations. They actually tried to bomb Canterbury Cathedral. They did manage Coventry Cathedral. Coventry was a manufacturing center. And of course, in London, the damage was perfectly horrible. Or before and after pictures inside the British Museum. Um, the good news, of course, is that the goodies had all been taken off to safe storage in the countryside and all came back. I don't think the British Museum lost anything of significance, but still the, the point was taken. Um, cultural property is in terrible danger in war. Not only destruction, but also looting. And famously, the high-ranking Nazi officers like Goering were very fond of collecting other people's art for their own private usage. Hitler and envisioned opening a gigantic museum in Linz, his hometown in Austria, something along the lines of Napoleon's use of the Louvre. And so 
the German armies sucked up what they could, whether it was from art museums or from the intimidation and murder of rich Jewish collectors, whatever, and amassed an enormous amount of art. You can see it there in the lower right, stored in some abbey or other, awaiting further instructions. Germany itself, of course, suffered horribly in the war from uh, deliberately targeted acts of, of bombing. Uh, that's uh, Aachen Cathedral on the left. Uh, we know about the Dresden firestorm late in the war, the point of which was basically to demoralize the population in great cultural centers. Famously, the American army enlisted some <laughs> now famous art historians that accompanied the American invasion of Italy to advise them specifically on what not to bomb, what to avoid, what to protect, and then after the war, where to find the buried treasures of Europe that the, the Germans had hidden in caves and whatnot. Look, there's Mr. Bradley Patton Eisenhower's themselves uh, inspecting one of the German storage tunnels after the war. This has recently become a popular subject of First, it was a book, The Monuments Men, Allied Heroes, Nazi Thieves, and the Greatest Treasure Hunt in History. And shortly after that, a movie with, good God, George Clooney, Matt Damon, all those good guys uh, presenting this, this very activity. A laudable attempt in, in all accounts and kind of unprecedented. That said, we weren't innocent of it either as the American army, uh, Allied armies moved up Italy in the late years of the war. They also caused a tremendous amount of destruction in Palermo, in and around Naples, Monte Cassino Abbey, famously. And look how close they came to the Last Supper. There are the picture on the left. The Last Supper is there behind the barricade on the right-hand wall. The church right in front of it, the refectory at least, got smithereened. And yes, it did survive the war. And you could reproduce that photo all over the place. Um, I know similar stories from Istanbul and the Hagia Sophia. After World War II, there was a great deal of effort made, led really by the Americans, I think it's fair to say, to restore all of this. How on earth do you repatriate 10,000 church bells that have been collected to melt down in bronze? Uh, how do you repatriate all of those Torah scrolls when you know, six million Jews have been murdered in Europe? Uh, how to repatriate all those paintings. And they're still doing it. And yes, the government of Austria still has a stack of those things and is dragging its feet to the present day on repatriating them. So it's out of this milieu that the 1954 Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property in the Event of Armed Conflict, the Hague Convention 1954 came about. It stated a number of principles that are still at the heart of cultural protection law. One, the cultural heritage of any people is the cultural heritage of all. It obligated states to identify, catalog, and protect their own monuments. You can't just sit there, wait for someone else to do it. During wartime, states must not put their own cultural property in harm's way. In other words, it's no fair putting your soldiers in the middle of a cultural landmark, hoping nobody's gonna hit it. It's done all the time, but it's against international law now. Uh, deliberately targeting and destroying non-military cultural monuments is understood now as a war crime. And again, the principle is up there for abuse right up into the present moment. And finally, this is, I think, interesting, that military units themselves should include experts on cultural property to advise how they operate. Of course, protecting the natural patrimony in time of war is still a real problem. Um, back in the 90s, it was Afghanistan, where the Taliban deliberately targeted any monuments of the country's Buddhist past. Uh, Taliban, uh, Islamic, uh, an anti, anti-iconic, systematically blew up treasure in the National Museum and famously blew up the Bamiyan Buddhas. The next great case to worry about was Iraq and continues to be a worry. Iraq, one of the richest archeological sites in the world, one of the oldest sites of civilization in the world, 
with superb museums up and down the, the, the place and lots and lots of sites to loot. And yes, the museum in Baghdad and in Mosul uh, and elsewhere, they were looted by the, um, the Islamic State. They were destroyed, they were vandalized and smugglers moved in in a huge way to exploit the untended archeological sites, such as you see in the lower left there. Those are all illegal excavators holes digging up uh, an important site. That picture on the right, I really love it. That's a piece that I studied in graduate school, the woman of Warka, it's a life-size mask. Uh, we're not sure what its function was, but it disappeared from the Baghdad Museum during the war. A few years after the war, somebody drove by the museum, tossed the guard something wrapped in a blanket, and it proved to be that head and drove off. And they said, thank you very much. They've never pursued it, but well, at least that one came back to the museum. It's still going on today, of course, and we're hearing reports now that Russia, in its aim to destroy Ukrainian individuality, you know, is trying to basically culture cancel Ukraine and is going systematically looting the museums of Ukraine, not just for the goodies themselves, but also to destroy or at least hide any evidence of Ukrainian civilization as distinct from Russia. They're also beginning to bomb monasteries. Um, some of you may have seen my earlier talk of just a year ago, my fears for the World Heritage Monuments of Kiev, which last I heard are still intact. Glory, hallelujah, but for how long? So besides the 1954 Hague Convention, um, how do we preserve cultural property? There's a good deal now of international law sponsored by UNESCO, United Nations Educational Scientific and Cultural Organization. They've taken the lead here. Um, a very important way that they operate is through the World Heritage Program, established 1972, in action from 1975. This sets up a whole bureau in Paris at UNESCO's headquarters that tracks and publishes and publicizes the world's most important cultural sites identified by the host countries themselves, not by UNESCO. And let me talk a little bit about that. Forgive the bullet points, but there they are. They're, I hope, useful. Um, the current list is, stands at 1,157 sites. I checked that yesterday. Sites can be monuments of culture. They can also be natural places, like the Grand Canyon, uh, Victoria Falls, places like that. Member states propose their own sites. UNESCO doesn't. And every two years they meet and they review all the applications. It takes years to get a site listed, years of proposals and plans and back and forth as UNESCO tries to shape the plans to include sustainable management plans. So you don't just say, um, we'd like to list the Taj Mahal. UNESCO comes back and says, yes, but how are you going to manage it? How are you going to control access? How are you going to try to keep things clean and accessible and all of those things. There are several categories of cultural monuments UNESCO encourages, particularly monuments of long lost cultures that have no current evidence. That would include, say, the um, Anasazi Indians of the American Southwest, though I think some locals might dispute the fact that they've disappeared. Um, that becomes actually a problem in, say, consider Armenian monuments in Turkey. Turkey has no love for Armenian culture for reasons of its own and has put almost no effort into preserving substantial monuments that just started to cooperate. Uh, the great Armenian medieval capital Ani is right at the border uh, between Turkey and what was once the Soviet Union and it's falling to pieces, but they've just started to intervene. Sites can be spread over several nations. This is true a lot in Europe. Say there's a site called the Natural Beach Forests of Europe, and it's got individual sites in, oh, seven or eight different countries. There is a special list of sites that have been listed but are now in danger. 
And those are a particular concern, of course, of everybody. And yes, they can be delisted. Dresden actually got taken off the list. Usually it's for development. They build a bridge in the middle of what was supposed to be a forest. Uh-oh. Liverpool has been taken off the list because of developing the waterfront that's supposed to be Victorian. And there was some nature preserve in one of the Gulf states that turned into a parking lot and that got delisted. It's funny, they don't just take them off the list. When you go online, they leave the name with a great big line through it so that everybody understands. And um, these have become huge for international tourism. What are some of the American sites, just to give you an idea? Uh, what they do is they use different colors. When you go to the list online, a yellow diamond is a cultural monument. A green diamond is a natural monument. So Mesa Verde is gold, Yellowstone is green. Everglades is red, which means it is one of the world sites in danger. And again, it's from overdevelopment. UNESCO is very concerned about that. You notice a lot of the American monuments are um, pre-modern Indian cultures, Native American cultures. Again, that's something UNESCO favors. They're listed in order of their own listing, which kind of gives you a sense of what was considered most important at first. Mesa Verde, Yellowstone, Everglades, Grand Canyon, Independence Hall, and then later ones um, reflect later concerns. Of course, our own beautiful island features a World Heritage Site, the Volcanoes National Park. Absolutely, it was listed in 1987. It's one of the very first American sites to be listed. Uh, and if you go there, what you want to do is you want to look for that little symbol in the upper left. There's a circle with a square in it. That's the World Heritage Site designation. And anywhere in the world you go, you may see that. This is from a few years ago, but it gives you a sense of the endangered sites, the official endangered sites, things that have been inscribed on the list, say two sites in Afghanistan, um, a bunch of them in Central Africa and the Sahel, where there's been fighting in Congo and the Sahel, um, Birmingham, or sorry, uh, Liverpool, you can see up in England, that has since been delisted and a number of sites in the war zones in the Middle East, in Syria, Iraq, Turkey, Egypt, and so forth. There's a limit. What can UNESCO provide? They can provide enormous expertise, some funding, but they don't have an enforcement army, no troops. They have to depend on local governments to enforce. I think the World Heritage Program really first came to world attention when the Taliban government of Afghanistan deliberately destroyed the two largest Buddhist sculptures in the world called Blam, but there's before and after, um, as a way of both destroying Buddhist monuments in the Islamic State, but also not as well understood as a way of harassing the citizens of that particular valley who were a particularly unpopular minority to the Taliban. Oh dear. The crises continue. Uh, Syria has a number of fantastic world heritage sites. Palermo, Aleppo, uh, Crusader fortresses, the city of Damascus and so forth. Many of them terribly destroyed. On the left there, you can see the great mosque of Aleppo before and after someone blew up the minaret. They're not even sure who the Taliban, or excuse me, the ISIS was proud of blowing up the reconstructed ruins of Palmyra. Oh dear. All right, World Heritage Site protection is a good thing. Who do they turn to for technical help? And what rules do they follow? The consensus, and it's a good solid consensus now, is to be guided in restoration by the Venice Charter of 1964. This is put together by the International Congress of Architects and Technicians of Historical Monuments. It's been adopted by ECOMOS, which is a UNESCO branch, a year later, and this now guides principles in preservation and reconstruction and reuse of ancient monuments. As it says down there, it's essential the principles guiding the preservation and restoration of ancient buildings should be agreed and laid down on an international basis with each country responsible 
for applying the plan within the framework of its own culture and traditions. Glory, hallelujah. What does that include? Let me just give you a taste of the principles here. Um, now, Article 4 is really important. If you've got a monument, you have to maintain it. And this has actually had a big impact on archaeology. It's understood now that you can't just uncover a big site. If you do that, you'd better have plan and funding for eternity, preserving that site and conserving the artifacts. And that now has led to a, quite a, a, a change in archaeological practice. They encourage reusing buildings. Buildings are always best in use and to reuse them in an appropriate way. So if it's an old church, don't turn it into a bar. If it's a mosque, don't turn it into a nightclub. Find some culturally appropriate reuse. Turning a church into a meditation center is great. Turning some cultural thing into a, a museum is terrific, uh, but something desirable, something not embarrassing. Article six encourages taking the setting into account. Don't develop around it on scale. Try to keep the neighborhood you find something in to scale and to function as much as it's possible. And it's not always possible. Sometimes an old monument finds itself in the middle of an industrial zone or in a crowded apartment complex. And that's just the way it is. Number seven, and we're gonna come back to this. Very important, a monument is inseparable from the history to which it bears witness and the setting in which it occurs. Don't move monuments unless it's absolutely necessary. And finally, and again, we'll come back to this. Decorative items that are an integral part of a monument should not be removed and must only be removed if that's the only way to ensure their preservation. If you're gonna restore something, use as far as you can authentic materials or similar materials and if you have to rebuild something make it obvious in some way a line a change in color make it obvious where there's been a change between original fabric and modernized fabric that helps everybody understand what they're actually looking at and finally article 10 for god's sake document whatever you did Surprisingly, it's not always done. So who works on these things? ICOMOS, what's that? International Council on Monuments and Sites. This works closely with UNESCO. This is the actual technical advisory arm for World Heritage Site Preservation. They're the people you call in to assess what can be done. And they follow closely the Venice principles. Another important NGO concerned here is the World Monuments Fund, bless their hearts. I've had a close look at their work on occasion. These are the actual technical experts. These are actually architects that'll take six months off. They'll go off to Istanbul. They will teach locals how to restore a 12th century church. They'll get the roof rebuilt. They always start with a roof and at least stabilize the structure. They're not so big into renovation, as just basic stabilization. Let's get out there and put up some earthquake proofing before we lose any more of the building. They also are important for their own monuments watch. Every year or so, they publish their own list of monuments under threat. And since they're not tied to a government, they can be a lot more honest. They can include those Armenian monuments in Turkey. They can include Uyghur monuments in China and locals can't object. World Heritage designation does come with a tremendous amount of tourist interest now. There's a whole tourist industry built around visiting World Heritage sites. Uh, I happened to be in Penang in Malaysia the year that Georgetown Penang was put on the list. And look at the banners all over the city. They were so proud. We're on the list. We're on the list. And I suspect that at this point, they're going to be swamped. And again, you can see that little symbol now on the right side of my photo, the circle with the diamond shape in it indicating World Heritage Site. So how do you deal with that? Well, one of the things that ECOMOS and all those other NGOs put a lot of thought into is managing tourism, especially at sites that are trampled, like the Acropolis in Athens, like the Palace of Knossos here in Crete, like uh, Borobudur, like um, 
you know, Angkor Wat in Cambodia. So management of tourism is now an integral part of all of this. Borobudur in Java. Oh my goodness, what a marvelous thing. The largest Buddhist stupa ever built. Spectacular and absolutely falling apart when it came into world heritage status. And so it was basically rebuilt from the ground up by the World Monuments Fund and UNESCO in the 1980s. It was built on an artificial hill. Drainage was eating away at the foundations. It was really on the danger of collapse. And so they essentially took it all darn, darn thing apart, uh, rebuilt it with interior drainage <laughs> and, and beefed up security while trying not to make anything new interfere with what was there old. And, and there's virtually nothing major that they added or had to add. They simply had to make the structure better. But they also, at the same time, did a wonderful thing. I've been there, it's spectacular, and from the monument, you can't see anything except gorgeous palm forests and smoking volcanoes. It really is one of the most spectacular places I've ever, ever seen. It's still in use by the small local Buddhist community on their holy days. They've made it available to the Buddhists to come and do their thing there. And they've simply hidden all of the fairly close by hotel, retail, parking, restaurant infrastructure. There's a museum there. They're invisible from the monument, even though they're within walking distance. It's very, very cleverly done. So this, I think, is a real model for managing world heritage sites. I go on to my second topic, which is international law on collecting, looting, and smuggling. Oh my, this was addressed in the major way, the major way, by UNESCO 1970. Convention on the Means of Prohibiting and Preventing the Illicit Import and Transfer of Ownership of Cult Property, i.e. looting. The first version of this, 1970, set this up as a state-to-state -state procedure. So in this case, Ecuador discovered that Italians had earlier in the 20th century illegally taken a whole bunch of Ecuadorian pre-Columbian goodies, taken them off to Italy. They, under this law, they negotiated with the Italian government and the Italian government, bless his heart, sent them back. That's the way it's supposed to work. So how does it work? Well, it reinforces the Hague Convention's warnings to safeguard your own property. First of all. Second, it obligates states to return objects that are shown to be looted from other states' museums. So, you know, if Peru taps you on the shoulder, or Ecuador, you have to respond. It requires state to state negotiations, individuals don't apply. It, since 1970, it's very rarely applied, rarely enforced. But what it has done is established 1970 as the baseline for any country that didn't already have antiquities laws in place. And some countries did. Turkey's great law goes back to 1960. That's when Turkey said no more unauthorized smuggling. And anything that gets out of Turkey past 1960 has to be certified by Turkey. But 1970 is now the worldwide standard for that. Uh, US is a signatory. And importantly, New York courts particularly the federal courts in New York and the Ninth District in San Francisco have been very aggressive applying um, American law to these principles and have pushed for a number of restitutions uh, of mostly pre-Columbian material and also Italian and Turkish material. The hardest issue right now for museums and collectors and dealers is the new discussion of the return of cultural treasures. What laws apply? What principles apply? What laws don't apply? And this is a huge topic now of scholarly and popular and professional discussion. Enter the Unidroid. This is the great law in 1995, which really fixed the holes in the 1970 uh, UNESCO Convention. They attempted to strengthen the provisions of that earlier one 
and specifically to address concerns of the art market itself, which felt that 1970 was too one-sided. It was all about illegal, give it back. The aim of the Unitrate is really to put the smuggling business out of business by stigmatizing collecting of illegal antiquities, particularly Cambodian. They've had a lot of success. You just don't buy Cambodian antiquities anymore. It's socially unacceptable. They're trying to squeeze the middlemen and squeeze the origins and also to let up a little bit on collectors. Collectors who may have innocently bought something. They thought they'd done due diligence. Maybe they hadn't. Anymore, Unitroit says, if you're sold a stolen antiquity, the fault belongs to the dealer. It's up to the dealers to show that they did due diligence before selling it to a collector. And so in some circumstances, a collector can give up a stolen antiquity and get recompensed at the expense of the dealer who sold it. That's an interesting idea. Another important idea is that it identifies market and transit states and source states, and it puts different rules on them. So for instance, China is a major source state for illegal antiquities. It's also a major market state <laughs> because Chinese collectors like Chinese things. A transit state is a place like Hong Kong or Switzerland where everybody knows if you can use them, if you can get them to those places, you can fence them through those places. Another big change is it allows individuals to sue somebody else for the return of their stolen art or their museum stolen art or their ancestor stolen art. There are statutes of limitations and they vary depending on the circumstances. Um, basically, you are given three years to file a claim from the time you found out about the theft and its circumstances. Governments get a longer period of time to file and some things, there's no statute of limitations, say if a museum has had a, ro uh, a robbery. There's no limit on um, time limit on trying to get it back. Sadly, it's still not ratified by the US. Probably never will be. I don't know why. But again, American courts have been simply acting on its principles anyway and getting a lot of things sorted out. <laughs> Here's an interesting map. I like this. Source states, transit states, and market states, and they're often the same. Um, you can see an awful lot of activity coming out of the various states in Europe, which until quite recently have had quite a varied response to smuggling and theft. Britain, London has been notably lax. London is one of the fences. Uh, Switzerland, yes. Hong Kong, yes. Um, New York, not so much. The New York courts are quite severe on this now. And so you really have to be careful trading antiquities to and from the US. I shot this picture in Hong Kong a few years ago on Hollywood Road, where all the antiquities dealers are. And so I tell my students, well, whatever you buy there, it's probably going to either be real or fake or stolen. Take your pick. Good luck. <laughs> provenance, due diligence on provenance. Provenance means the, the place of origin. And again, dealers, museums, and collectors now are forced by Unitroit and local courts to pay more attention to proper documentation, legal collecting, and so on. Has that stopped the antiquities trade? Absolutely not. But it is getting stuff repatriated. Let me give you a few examples. This is a famous one from a few years ago. It still breaks my heart. That is the most beautiful Greek vase I have ever seen. And it was briefly in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Uh, was purchased in 1972 for what was then a whopper price um, with very little attention paid to provenance. The curator wanted it. He actually sold off half of the Mets coin collection to get that vase. And that's a whole ethical issue of its own right. Anyway, some years later, the state of Italy found smoking gun proof that that particular vase had been looted from a particular Etruscan tomb near Rome, had been smuggled 
through Switzerland and sold to the Met with fake paperwork. Open shut case, ouch, but the piece did go back to Italy. There it was being unveiled by the Italian curators in 2008. And that's my photo of it sitting in absolute isolation in a museum nobody visits in Rome, the Etruscan Museum. It is still drop dead gorgeous. It's a wonderful museum. Um, I found the guard in that room asleep. Oh, well, but that's the way it is. Here's a messier case, not open shut. Back in the 19th century, Heinrich Schliemann and his wife, Sophie, the excavators of Troy, found a stash of gold jewelry and bronze vessels. Whoa! Um, he had been specifically forbidden to remove it by Ottoman law. The Ottomans actually had an antiquities law already in the early 19th century. And archaeologists had to apply, as they do today, for permission to excavate under certain circumstances with you know, X, Y, and Z amendments. He simply flaunted them all, ignored them, flouted them all, I should say. Apparently smuggled a lot of the stuff out under his great um, coat there. Published them himself erroneously as dating to the Trojan War. They are the treasures of Priam. Well, they're nothing of the sort, but they are terrifically interesting uh, examples of bronze and early Iron Age uh, objects. Where did they go? Well, after World War II, they were missing from the Berlin Museum. Oh, wait, what were they doing in the Berlin Museum? Ah, well, Schliemann was born German. He also had Greek citizenship. He also spent some time in the U.S. and spent a lot of time in Ottoman Turkey. But he decided they belonged in his own home, Germany. So that's where they went. And after World War II, they were gone. That museum was bombed. Those objects were missing. When I went to school, they were lost. No one knew. There were rumors they were maybe in Leningrad. There were rumors they were in Switzerland in a bank vault. Well, they finally showed up in the 1990s in Moscow. And it turns out that the Soviet army had in fact looted them from the ruins of Berlin, stuffed them on a train with a lot of other goodies and shipped them off to Moscow where they spent decades in secret storage. And at this point, the Russians simply say, sorry, we're keeping them. We're not repatriating them to anyone. They don't belong to Germany anymore. They belong to us and we're keeping them as war reparations. Who else contested this? Well, Turkey saying, well, wait a minute, the Ottomans didn't want those to leave. And Greece saying, well, we won the Trojan War. <laughs> we should have them. Anyway, it's a good example of the ambiguity of colonial era and pre-modern collecting. It's just too much ambiguity. Too many borders have changed. Too many permits have been lost. And at this point, my thought is anything that's been out of the hands of modern law, out of reach of modern law, is, is really kind of up for grabs. Very much under international law, though, is Nazi era looting of uh, Jewish uh, Holocaust victims, art collections, and other Jewish cultural material. This is huge right now. And a number of cases have been successfully pursued, again, particularly in US courts, but also across Europe, as descendants of Holocaust victims have litigated often successfully to get family treasures returned. Demonstrating that is difficult, and some countries have made it almost impossible. Um, Austria famously says, sure, we'll repatriate it. All you got to do is provide a pyramid's worth of proof. And that's been tricky. They've had more success at the U.S. courts. And at this point, virtually every American museum is compelled, feels compelled to check the provenance of anything that they obtained in the 1940s or early 1950s. And a shocking number of things have been returned to private patrons or returned to museums in Europe that once held these things. How do they find out? Often these things pop up in auction records. There's also a lot of um, diligent research. Here's a famous example. Uh, recently, one of the most popular paintings in the Belvedere Palace Museum in Vienna, uh, they had a group of uh, Gustav Klimt painting, just spectacular, and everybody loves Adele Blochbauer. 
It's a huge portrait, larger than life size, and drop dead gorgeous. It's one of six that were litigated by heirs of the Jewish family of herself, who now live in Los Angeles, that were able to demonstrate that those Klimt paintings belonged to their family and were taken from the family under pressure as the family fled Vienna uh, during World War II um, as a way to avoid the Holocaust. The American court, it actually went all the way to the US Supreme Court, which said, yes, let this proceed. The Supreme Court turned it over a panel of art experts who said, yes, this is the case, and chose those six words to be repatriated, uh, restituted to the family, who then promptly sold them, as was their right. And they now form <laughs> the absolute heart, soul, and Mona Lisa of the Neue Gallery in New York, Ronald Lauder's private museum. What's the worst case for both historic preservation and for looting? It's probably Angkor Wat, or all of the Angkor monuments. It's a number of them in Cambodia. Long a world heritage site, arguably right up at Borobudur, the most beautiful place I've ever been. Famously, has been looted of its sculptures, not just the 3D ones, but even the, the wall sculptures for years during the 1970s and 80s and 90s, looters had the run of the place during Cambodia's wars, would actually take chainsaws and chainsaw stone reliefs off the wall, like those angels. Sometimes it worked, sometimes they broke. There was a lot of them, they didn't care. And then they would fence them through, for instance, Thailand, where they actually have documentation of collectors going to an antique dealer being shown a book of photographs of things that could be looted to order. They say, oh, I'd like that. And in due time, that would appear in a package from Thailand. It's a huge thing. And at this point, UNESCO has been so active, as has the art world, in condemning the looting of Cambodia, that at this point, Cambodian sculpture is really stigmatized on the art market. So often we simply won't handle it. Most of the major auction houses won't handle it. And just last year, this is a real stunner. Douglas Latchford, oh, there's an S at the end of that. Douglas Latchford is one of the, was one of the major scholars on Cambodian sculpture. He died in 2019, and it turned out he was one of the major uh, smugglers. He was actually working with Cambodian and Thai smuggling teams, identifying loot collecting it and selling it off. Good thing he's dead, he's not missed. His daughter has already offered a hundred of his best pieces, sculpture pieces back to Cambodia. They're thrilled. That's a picture of the return ceremony. And just a few weeks ago, I learned, she's just also announced the existence. No one even knew the existence of his collection of ancient Khmer crown jewels. Gold, silver, things no one knew even existed except from their sculptures. And those are going back to Cambodia too. The Cambodians, of course, are so excited, they're gonna build a whole new wing to their national museum. Speaking of which, how do you preserve what's left? Well, it's not ideal, but the simplest way is to take any threatened sculpture off-site and put it into the National Museum. Case in point here is the Leper King. On the left, that's how he used to look. And on the right, there's a replica in place now at Encore. And the original is kept here at the National Museum, which has also become a major site for the preservation of Cambodian antiquities, including training in restoration at the Smithsonian. Uh, I'm glad to say lots of help from Japan, lots of help from Canada, lots of help from Australia to help put Cambodia's national culture back together. The doozy of the whole discussion of course, are the Parthenon sculptures that now live in the British Museum that were looted, if you wish, collected, if you wish, anyway, gotten uh, around 1800 to 1806 by Lord Elgin and are often known as the Elgin Marbles, the star of the British Museum. It's the ultimate debate really over collecting and repatriation because 
really none of the laws I've discussed apply. Let's take a look. There's the Parthenon. First thing to remember, of course, is that the Parthenon, the Acropolis of Athens, are the central monument of Greek cultural identity. There's you know, no second place. This is on the wall of every Greek restaurant you've ever been to. <laughs> this is the center of Athens. It's the center of Greek cultural pride and pride right. What happened? Well, it was actually intact until the 17th century when the Ottoman Turks moved in. Actually, they moved in 1456, I think. So they've been there a while. Yeah, and um, by the 1820s, we're, we're using the thing as a storage depot. I see it's by the 17th century, we use it as an ammo depot. Oh dear, had a whole fort up there. It blew up one day when the Venetians, the Venetians, yeah, lobbed a bomb at it and blew the thing up. In around 1800, Lord Elgin, a British diplomat, was on his way to Constantinople, stopped in Athens, admired the ruins, and oh, look at all those nice sculptures, apparently applied for some kind of permission to work up there. What kind of permission is still controversial? No one's ever found a document. But the Ottomans gave him permission to study, to sketch, and he claims to collect the sculptures. That's the ambiguous point. Was he given permission to collect and transport them? We simply don't know. It's argued both ways. In any case, What's he getting? He's getting things that were way up in the air, and he actually hired a team of locals to go and saw the darn things off the building. Yes, he did. Toss them down, some of them smashed, some of them didn't, a boatload of them sank. What's left ended up in Britain, where he kind of insisted that Parliament purchase the things for the new British Museum, and the British Museum was not thrilled. Parliament said, okay, they bought them, and then they imposed on the British Museum, the requirement that they take the things and never give them up. This is all part of the current story. So here they are in their little mini temple in the British Museum. Gorgeous, gorgeous things taken off the wall, piece by piece. About half of these things are there, half are scattered. Some of the metopes are in the British Museum. Athens has demanded these things return to Athens as integral to the Parthenon, and they've done so since the 1960s. When I was in school, the argument was, oh, Greece can't take care of such wonderful things. They're better off in London. No one believes that anymore. The old Acropolis Museum was a dump, granted, but guess what? The new Acropolis Museum is spectacular and was deliberately built as a magnet to attract those things back. Look where it is. It is just below the Parthenon and aligned with it. <laughs> the top floor is, in essence, a replica of the Parthenon with big windows facing the original. Remember those principles of the Venice Charter that said that pieces of buildings ought to be kept as close as possible to the original building. And if they can't be left, it can't be put back in place, at least cared for in proximity. Doesn't get better than this. The museum is cleverly designed so that you climb up and up as if you were climbing up the Acropolis Hill. And at the top level, there are the Parthenon sculptures arranged in their correct order, which they're not in London. Closer than they would have been originals. So you can actually see them. They're not 40 feet up in the air like the originals. Some of these are original sculptures. Most of them are not. They're, the tapes are made of blinding white plaster so that you always know that you're looking at something new. Again, that's in line with Venice Charter principles. But there's a space for everything, and one by one now, institutions all across Europe and America are inspired by this museum to send back their little piece of the Parthenon. One came back just the other day from the Vatican. And there they are with the Parthenon right out the window. Spectacular. So the latest rumor, and this is just weeks old, is that finally the British Museum and uh, the Athens government are negotiating. The Brits have always refused. They say, sorry, they're in the museum. The museum can't give them back because they're stopped by an act of parliament. 
blah, 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 blah. The discussion now is, is there a way to start circulating some of the Parthenon sculptures in groups back to Athens with a guarantee that they will go back to London? That's hard. My suspicion is it's just never going to happen. The instant those things go back to Athens, there are going to be demonstrations on the street of Athens before they ever go back to London. But I don't know. I'm not in on the negotiations. But this is ongoing, and apparently it's imminent. What they're going to try, what the Brits are proposing, is a step-by-step -step kind of loan to Athens. Okay, if you return it, we'll send you another bunch. That's one approach. Certainly that museum, the existence of that museum has actually changed the discussion. It's such an ideal location for the sculptures. It's beginning to make the British Museum look cold, wet, and dark by comparison. There is one precedent. Again, international law does not apply. The circumstances, the original uh, looting of the Parthenon are obscure. There's no current law that applies. What really applies now is sentiment, if you will, um, cultural consensus. And the best analogy I know of is the return to Iceland of medieval Icelandic manuscripts from Denmark once Iceland became independent of Denmark. Independence 1940 during World War II, 1944, I'm sorry, during World War II. Iceland simply asked for them back. And after a long debate, Denmark sent them back what amounts to Iceland's greatest medieval national treasure, and they are. The current controversy, similar, involves colonial looting. And this is really, I think, the hottest topic now in all of this, is how do you deal with colonial situations? These are the famous Benin bronzes. They were looted, and I use looted deliberately. They were deliberately looted in 1897 by the British Army in Benin from the Benin Palace as a punitive action against the rebellion. They've been sold all around the world. They're dispersed globally. Britain has most of them now, and there they are in the lower right, a new display. Gorgeous things, absolutely central to the patrimony of West Africa. Ah, so there's been recent developments. They're getting sympathy. Ben, uh, Benin, which is within Nigeria. Nigeria now has designs for a new national museum following the Athens model. They are lobbying hard around the world for the return of these things. The Smithsonian has just announced that the Smithsonian Museum of African Art is going to return theirs. Ouch, but yes. This is kind of clear cut because it was a clear cut act of looting. It's not ambiguous, nothing ambiguous about it. Well documented, looting is the operative word. What about these other things? The British Museum owns that wonderful Moai from Easter Island, um, Orongo, famous on Easter Island. It sits now in one of the grand spaces in the, the British Museum. They also have the Rosetta Stone that helped crack the ancient Egyptian language. That's in the British Museum. Both were collected under ambiguous circumstances. They weren't looted by any legal standard, but in both cases, they are absolutely central to another country's narrative and self-image. And sure enough, both Egypt and um, Ecuador have lobbied hard to get those things returned to the local cultures. The Humboldt Forum, brand new museum. Yes, that's a brand new building, uh, a rebuilt building in the heart of Berlin. Um, the Humboldt Forum is now the home of Berlin's Museum of Asian Art and the Ethnology Museum. And even before it opened, it almost collapsed under the criticism of scholars for presenting essentially colonial era loot with little explanation or context and little investigation into provenance. Even before it opened in 2020, in the middle of the plague, uh, 2018, there was a big scholarly convention that did a blast of the place. Mr. Macron, president of France, may have the last word in all of this. In the meantime, just at the same time, 
he announced that France was committed to returning uh, West African treasures to former French colonies. Which ones was left ambiguous? This is all a matter of negotiation, but he means it. And well, let me just summarize that. I think that that is the current state of this, again, a very wishy-washy question of what do you do about colonial collecting that occurred in colonial situations where it wasn't obviously looting, it was just, you know, we had this, we got it, we brought it back to Paris or Berlin or the Vatican. What do you do? And the Met is facing a lot of pressure under this, as are many American museums. I think the current state of things, since there isn't a single law or UNESCO convention governing colonial situations, what's happening now is country to country negotiation, case by case, uh, between the French and the Africans, between the Germans and the Africans, between the Smithsonian and everybody, and, um, and, and the Met and the Getty Museums in Italy and Turkey. So I think that's where it is. So I'm gonna to have to leave that question ambiguous because that's exactly what it is in international law. That's my, my topic, but it's certainly worth noting related topics that are good for other lectures. Who speaks for the past is a big discussion now. Who interprets? The museum, the locals, who? And that's getting a lot of good and overdue attention. How things are explained, how things are displayed. Another terrifically interesting topic is American national law concerning archaeology, whether it's uh, objects addressed by the ARPA Act, 1979, or Native American graves and repatriation, which is huge, NAGPRA, 1990, causing every museum in the U.S. to search its, its storage rooms for Native American burial um, skeletons, remains, whatnot, and decide what to do with them. And specifically, of course, that concerns Hawaii. So happily, currently, um, Keone Alvarez is promoting his new movie, Kahu, on sacred Hawaiian burials. I understand it's showing Uncle Roberts on Saturday this week. Uh, he's also spoken here recently at the EHCC on the topic. Uh, so this is a very hot topic. It's not mine to address, but I think it's related to what I've been talking about. So that is my stuff, and I will be very happy to take any questions or discussion. Carol, yeah. Yeah, um, I have a quick comment and then um, a question for you. My comment for everyone who's listening to this is that if you are interested in the subject of looting from the Cambodian temples, a friend of mine, Eric Stone, wrote a wonderful um, it's actually kind of a suspense novel, but it's uh, if you like learn things in, in an easy way. So you're you're reading fiction and it's uh, very engaging. The name of the book is Grave Imports by Eric Stone, and it's extremely well researched. And I learned a great deal from reading it. So that's my comment. Now, my question is for you, Larry, your presentation um, was primarily factual without a whole lot of opinions in it, but mm -hmm. I would, my imagination was kind of captured by the story of the Etruscan vase that went back from the Met to Italy, and it seemed that you were expressing some regret because you felt that more people would see it at the Met than would see it at this nearly empty museum in Italy. Do you think that accessibility, as in how many people will get to see something that was perhaps looted, um, should be a factor in deciding whether it's, you know, um, an object stays where it is now or whether it goes back to where it came from? Is that important? It's an excellent question, and it's an excellent counter-argument. Um, the conservative argument in all of this is pretty much that. The great museums should be actively displaying all the world's cultures, and that would include Etruscan, Italian, Greek, whatever, that that's a, a legitimate function of a, of a great national museum. Another argument along those lines is that there's something to be said in a violent world for objects that are dispersed. So that something is left when say the, the Taliban blow up everything in the 
uh, museum in Afghanistan, it wouldn't it have been nice if some of that stuff had been in some other museum for safekeeping. Uh, accessibility is, until very recently, that's what the Met would have argued, was that six million people a year are seeing that face. And that counts for something. Sentimentally, I agree. Sentimentally, that's just a favorite face of mine. <laughs> I taught it for years. I've loved it for years. I visited it for years, and I'm sad it's gone. But at heart, I would rather follow international law. The proof of looting and smuggling was absolutely cut and dried. And in that case, I have no argument except a tear running down one, one eye. What is Another solution to all this, and what they did with Italy, I, I should explain that more, is increasingly museums caught with smuggled goods are negotiating with other countries for long-term loan. Or in the Mets case, the vase went back, but now Italy is sending goodies to the Met every year and putting them kind of in the same place. And so the payoff is the Met now has access to a continuing stream of other goods. And that's also how the Getty has been dealing with Italy. Um, Turkey has not been as cooperative with that. Turkey has been after the Met forever, quite right. They had a bunch of stuff that was looted, stolen, and ended up in the Met and Dumbarton Oaks and a few other museums back in the 60s. Dumbarton Oaks has agreed with Turkey that Turkey owns those objects. Now they're on long-term loan to Dumbarton Oaks. The Mets had to actually return a bunch of stuff to Turkey and it hadn't worked out, I think, a successful loan agreement. But that's where museums are heading now, is okay, you can have the stuff back if it's proven, but can we arrange for some kind of short-term and long-term loan agreement? which kind of answers the question of accessibility. So that's my feeling. Yes, I'd love that if we could keep the vase, but now I realize that legally the Met was wrong and did the right thing. Thank you. Anybody else? Marty, you need your, your mic on. I do. Okay. There we go. Well, I do like the idea of, well, I don't know for a better word, that traveling show like, um, the De Young Museum in San Francisco just had a very well publicized show on ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. And so they probably get a lot more people, well, a lot of people, as it's a special occasion and gets a lot of advertising. And so a lot of people get to see the temporary mm -hmm. Egyptian items, which seems like a good solution rather than having them just stay where they were born, sort of. Yeah, and thank you for that. Um, Egypt, I, sh I should have given it more time here. Egypt has been a big player in all of this. Mm -hmm. And what they've learned to do is antiquities diplomacy. So for instance, they do circulate a lot of material and that's often a quid pro quo for returning things to them. And on the other side of that is museums that don't cooperate with Egypt don't get goodies. And that's how Egypt has been able to strong arm the Met and to strong arm the Louvre particularly into cooperating and even returning objects if they want to get any more goodies. Mm. And major museums are finding that it's better to play with the Egyptians than to try to ignore them. So even if there isn't law attached to a certain antiquity, um, Zahi Hawass, who's the, the, the famous director of, of everything archaeological in Egypt, is very good now at, at getting traction by, by using cultural diplomacy. And yeah, I think you're right. It benefits everybody. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, well, thank you so much. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Yes, Marty. I have something. Hello, Larry. Um, sure. Speaking of a violent world, um, uh, I was thinking about um, Kyoto and World War II and the oh. choosing, is this, a, is, this, is this an example? Yes, <laughs> it is. Well, you want to say something about that thing? Oh, well, are you finished with your comment? Yes, I am. Oh, Go okay. Ahead. 
Well, Kyoto is a, a great example. That's a special case. Uh, I can't remember his name, but oh, one of the big famous American um, East Asian specialists was an advisor to the presidents and said, don't touch Kyoto, just don't touch it. And they listened. Um, the British had been told the same about Dresden and went ahead and firebombed it anyway. The Americans did deliberately spare Kyoto on the urging of American scholarship, just spare the darn city, and they did. Didn't spare Tokyo, oh dear, but Kyoto, yes. Anything else? Okay, well, thank you so much for joining me.